In the Lab, a Texans podcast that takes a different look at things. Drew Doherty and John Harris have their lab coats and goggles on and the Bunsen burners burning. Here's Drew. In the lab time, Drew Doherty and John Harris. Good to see you. You're up in the press box. I'm in, I'm down in my office. We're both here inside NRG Stadium, but you're you're throwing a change up to the masses today. Yeah, to bit. me and the masses. You're up in the press box. You like it up there? Well, in, I mean, the catbird seat. One, yeah, it's one of the cool things I think about being uh, in a stadium is you can just. I mean, I don't. It's funny because I don't get up here much. I get up for yeah. like a lunch on Sunday, and then I go right back down, and then you know I have a down on the field so uh i don't get up here much but uh, it's quiet right now and so i kind of like quiet and get out of the look i i have one desk and it's our studio desk and i can't come upstairs because the whole tier thing and so whenever people need the desk i kind of got to move and so i'm like all right well you know what i'm gonna go up the press box and so i'm gonna do in the lab with you drew doherty from the press box and people don't like it well, there you go. Sorry, but I, don't, I want you to like it. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different because we've all seen the news. Whitney Merciless is no longer a Houston Texan. And uh, yeah, it's it's kind of one of the it's not a surprising move. It's one of those things that uh, and you'll hear a little bit later on the radio show tonight. You guys got a chance to talk with Nick Casario. It's one of those tough parts of the business. And he was a little expensive at this point and the team's moving on. So what we're going to do, we're going to tell a couple fun stories about Whitney (laughs) because he's been here a decade, you know, and aside from John weeks, he was the longest tenured Texan here this season. So John weeks remains and John weeks put out a nice Instagram post uh, showing the two of them walking out to midfield and talked about how he's family and Whitney himself put up a nice thank you post to Houston and the, the McNair family and the Texans organization. So uh, he is moving on, but I'm going to tell two stories and I'll get out of the way, or I'm going to tell one story and you tell one story and then I'll tell another and then I'll get out of the way. But uh, in 2010, 11, 12, and 13, I was at the airport the Friday morning of the draft. So Texans would have a first rounder on Thursday night. They'd fly him into town on Friday morning with his family and they'd, basically show him around the building. He'd have a press conference. He'd meet with the front office folks, his coaches, the equipment people, kind of a whirlwind day for the guy. And when I was there doing that back in those days, it was me and a guy named Sean Washington, who I don't know exactly what he did, but he did just about everything and did it well. And uh, it was the two of us. And we would ride in the limo to intercontinental airport and I had a camera and a microphone and he had some other stuff like some hats and stuff for the family and some newspaper article. And uh, when the family and, and the player would come out of the secure area, we were there to meet him and I'd, he'd introduce himself and then I'd say, hi, I'm Drew. It's good to meet you. Uh, we, we're going to put this microphone on you and we're going to record your experiences. So did that with Kareem Jackson, did that with JJ Watt, did it with Whitney Merciless, did it with DeAndre Hopkins. And it was pretty fun. By the time I got to Whitney, I'd sort of gotten it down better and I could, you know, white balance and uh, get the audio and all that stuff, framing. And it was fun seeing the Merciless family, his parents, his brother, go through what they went through. And I was in the limo ride from the airport here. And he's just a, a great dude. And coming out, you remember this, at Illinois, his final year there, he led the NCAA in sacks, and yeah. in forced fumbles. This was a bona fide you know, pass rusher. And they're adding to that 2011 defense, you thought, um, and making it even better for 2012. And he didn't yeah. play a whole lot in 12, but in spurts, he did some nice things. I think he had three sacks. And, um, you know, it was just a cool thing to be a part and see that that first day, that wonder, because I'm sure their heads are spinning or were spinning <laughs> yeah. at the time. And yeah. they're going to a new place. And they're excited. And he was excited to be here. And, he he knew that the Texans were winning at that point and had high expectations. And he was he was pumped to be a part of it. So that's one of the first things I thought of when I saw the news, and I was bummed and bummed for him on a personal. I, I understand football wise why it's all going down, but um, 
they, he's a good good dude and i had a lot of fun times with interviewing him and, and being around him over the years i'll tell another one in a little bit but you know what's the first thing you thought of when you saw what was going down with merciless well the first emotion is just sad because he when like you said when he showed up from the time he showed up in 2012 through now and hopefully this extends for decades and decades he became houston he really became a renaissance man of houston creating a restaurant concept um with um his restaurant entrepreneurs um chris shepherd for one charities of them. yeah chris shepherd um a great fan of the texans the things that he did for houston just take take the football we'll talk about the football but the fo- the football thing aside just what he did for houston what he did for families um, I know his charity, he focused his charity at different points on different um, uh, different sort of other charitable endeavors kind of within it, kind of like he was doing with his restaurant concept where yeah, they he had like it up. five he, different things. Yeah, He would mix it up. And one of those um, that he did, he focused on on uh, kids with autism. And obviously that strikes, you know, pretty close to, to my heart. And I just, you know, everything he did just, reeked of such professionalism such love for the city such love for people and that was probably the first thing that that hit me from a football standpoint there's always there's one seminal moment to me and it's week eight of the 2015 season against the tennessee titans now in the in 2015 you remember it was ugly there for a bit get beat by the kansas city chiefs right out of the gate quarterback controversy they're going back and forth we got spanked in atlanta the week prior we got out of miami and everything that could go wrong went wrong backup quarterback missed the plane it's 41 to nothing at the half i mean it is a complete and total disaster and that season is circling the drain like none of it so it's week eight and tennessee's coming in here 2015 and it was early in the game and they, the Titans ran at Whitney. And I'll never forget it. Whitney stoned the tackle. I mean, stoned him. Just absolutely stood him up. And the running back tried to cut. And he, could, he didn't know where to cut because of the way that Whitney had set the edge. He bounced out. Whitney made the tackle for a loss. The rest of that game, Whitney just took it over. He had, I think, three sacks in that game. He had a fourth. But it got negated because he accidentally had gotten his hand on Zach Mettenberger's. I think it was Zach Mettenberger. It may have been Mar- Mariota. I can't remember. Either way, he had had a fourth, but it got taken away because of the, I guess, I guess they called it a, a face mask. But I don't think he ever touched the face mask, but because he had his hand on the head, they called a penalty on it. And he went absolutely berserk. And this was a year after Genevieve Clowney had gotten drafted. So when JD got drafted, it's like, well, you know, you're going to put JD on the edge. And it was like, whoa, is Wit? the odd man out here you just draft him 2012 now 2014 you're drafting Jadeveon Clowney like where does wit fit in all this and, and I watched him during that 2014 season kind of in preseason and Vrabel Mike Vrabel was a position coach and just driving him hard I mean driving Whitney every single day and it really started paying off and it really kind of came to fruition in 2015 at that key moment and from that point forward especially in that season but going on Whitney was unbelievable there were times he's unblockable in the in the, in the uh, playoff game even though it was a 30 to nothing drubbing i think he had two and a half or three sacks yeah. in that game against the chiefs i mean he's the only one playing with 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 any juice that day i remember saying that on the radio on the broadcast like man whitney is like the only thing to really feel good about uh on what we should feel great about with a playoff team and he just he, he continued that and um he was so good that year and it was a guy that Really, in all honesty, I, I felt like he transformed himself because I think in 12 and 13 in particular, I remember 2013 in particular, watching him try to play the run like, oh, I mean, I, I was like, oh, boy, that's not great. And he got so much better at that. He learned all these different pass rush moves that he could use. I mean, double swipes and rips and spins and under. I mean, he had mm-hmm. so many different things at his disposal. It was really fun to watch this guy really work and work his craft. And that was the one thing I always felt is that 
he worked his craft. He didn't do it just on athleticism. He didn't just do it, you know, like work ethic, relentlessness. He worked his craft. He learned how to use his tools and use them in a right and proper way. And that, to me, made him one of the best pass rushers this organization has seen. He's not going to ever be remembered as, you know, JJ will be. Sure. Uh, and the numbers aren't going to be up where JJ was. But Whitney Merciless should be. When you start talking, okay, pass rushers, well, first, okay, J.J. Watt. Who else? Whitney would be the next name out of your mouth. He should be the next name out of your mouth. Above Mario, above Clowney, Whitney should be that next name that comes out of your mouth because of how he maximized his talent, he maximized his work ethic, and he then worked his craft on the field, and then off the field, there are none better. I mean, the guy yeah. was absolutely phenomenal people in Houston. Yeah, and then – um in 2016, in the spring, you find out Texans are going to play in Mexico City. It's going to be the first game in Mexico City in a long time, probably 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. So that's in – that's right, right around Thanksgiving. But in June, late May, the Texans wanted to send oh, – yeah. and the NFL wanted somebody from the Texans to go down and visit Mexico City and do some promotional things. So Whitney was chosen to be that guy, and I got to go with him a member of the uh, media relations team a guy named Brett Mikowski was there as well. Yeah, and then yeah. my boy, you guys went yeah. Daniel Velasco from marketing. He was there too. So we all went down and we, we had a, a rep from the NFL that was helping us out and she was really cool. But uh, you know, we saw the logo for the game on Vail. He did a press conference. We went and took a tour of the city on a, one of those double decker buses. It's yeah, you know, yeah, open. Yeah. We all, the only place we all ate together was this lunch as part of that tour. And it was one of the most delicious lunches we've ever had. But all of us that ate at that lunch wound up getting pretty nasty food poisoning. I don't know what it was, but we all got very, very, very sick. I was the first one to sort of start feeling the effects of it. And it, it happened the next day um, as we were at the airport leaving. And I went downstairs to the restroom and I came back up and I wasn't feeling right. I, I was kind of woozy. And I sat down on a, on a bar stool where we were eating our, uh, our lunch. And the next thing I know, I'm opening my eyes and I'm on the ground and oh. Whitney's looking at me. He's over me. Mikowski, Daniel Vlad, they're all looking at me like, hey, you all right? And Whitney's dabbing blood off of uh, right here, this cut. Oh, my um, gosh. Yeah, I mean, I split that open i split oh, the back of my head open i don't know if i ever knew that i knew you had gotten sick i didn't know that oh yeah. my god yeah he he um you know like most players probably would have just would have been caring and but would have been watching it from afar like hey let that let somebody else to he was in there he was he was uh he yeah. was he was just that, that's the type of dude he is and um and I, that'll always stick with me and that's a minor thing like he's just just helping out but i always remember that but he got sick uh, later the, the next day, and so did the other two. Um, you know, I, I had to go to the hospital be, to get, like, my head stitched up, and they were like, why would you pass oh, out? So they they did observation, yeah. but and I was fine. But they, they noticed that I was, like, dehydrated and going – so I got an IV, and I got better. They had to, like, just kind of fight it and let it go through their system. So I was better the next day, but they had it that, that whole week. And uh, he was, he's just a really cool guy. You know, I'm always going to remember him very fondly, and he's one of my favorite Houston Texans yeah. for sure. And I'm, I, I wish him well, and I hope, hope he does pop up with somebody else. Hope he gets a chance to play in the playoffs and, and win a yeah. ring. And and uh, I only wish the best for him, but I know, you know, he loves the city of Houston and he loves his time here. And uh, you know, I, I I'm a big fan of Whitney Merciless. Yeah. So I'll tell this quick one, and then we'll. Uh, and we always we'll, time out, uh, and we always used to joke about the mole that got us sick at that restaurant <laughs> in Mexico City. It's like, don't put so, mole on that, Whitney. You know, so after, you know, after a while, you know, I got to know, you know, we all get to know the guys a little bit. And so I got to know Wit. And so this was probably, I don't know, 2016, 2017. So we'd gotten to know each other for a few years. And so it was in and around draft time. And I was like, hey, Wit, um, you want to hear my draft report on you? You want to you want to hear what I like, what I said about you? Um, because I I read it years later and I was like, Yo, I think I hit this on the head, but I wanted to kind of see what, what he thought. So we, this is, I can't remember if we recorded this or if we were just kind of, kind of messing around beforehand, 
And so I read it to him and I'm watching, I'm reading, kind of watching his reaction. And he's like, I got about halfway through. He's like, dang. And so I kept going. I finished and he just looked at me. He goes, dog, you nailed it. I mean, and I mean, I didn't really say anything that was like totally you know, negative, but I did say, you know, look, there's, you know, this, he's going to have to learn how to do a couple things um, because he hasn't really done that at Illinois. So he's going to have to kind of add those to his repertoire, especially if he is put in this kind of defense, you know, because ironically at Illinois, he was a four, three defensive end. And there was always talk off this off season, like, Oh, he's going to be a four, three defense. Well, that's what he was at Illinois. Yeah. And so I think one of the comments I made was, you know, is, could, could he be a three, four outside linebacker? Because that'll just open things up. Um, you know, he'd have to learn how to drop in coverage and, and, you know, some of those things. But I got done. It actually is one of the best draft reports I had ever written and got just, I mean, dead on. And just seeing his reaction and him just looking at me like, Doug, you hit that like perfectly. And it was, <laughs> it was, it was kind of cool. It was confirmation, you know, that, you know, I had put something together that was pretty much dead on. And, and he, he lived up to it and, and then some. He was probably even better than what my, my report um, had actually been. So I'll post it on Twitter at some point when we post uh, this in the lab on social, I gotta, I gotta find it. 2012 is a long time ago and about three computers ago. So there's no telling where yeah. uh, that, uh, that scout report is from wit many, many years ago, but he thought I was dead on. So I, I felt that was validation <laughs> enough for me, especially coming from that guy. I mean, I could have been totally wrong and he would have told me I was right. Cause that's the kind of guy that he is. Um, but uh, I, he just, he made everybody feel, feel good. He yeah. made everybody feel good. And, and there aren't many people in this world that can make everybody feel good. Days like this for guys like you and me who, who work in the building and around these guys, it's a, it's a crappy day. You know, it's part of the business. We, we've seen it happen. You know, it's going to happen to everyone in one shape or another. But uh, best of luck and happy trails to you, Whitney Merciless. Uh, you've been a great Houston Texan and we'll always be, be big fans of yours. Uh, John, I think let's wrap it up, man. Cool. Yeah, you? man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Let's do it. Big thanks to Wit. You put it perfectly, Drew. And uh, yeah, this is a good. This is good to do to talk about that guy. Okie doke. We'll see you. Ra- see you around. And thank you for listening and watching, and in the lab. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to know when we post new content. Woo! <laughs>